be that. You're good. All right. So one of the things I'm going to do for you guys, and I did it for the first session, is I know there's no way we can get through all of our drills and everything and show you the correct way to do it. Uh, one of the things I am going to do the next time I do um, in-person clinics is I'm going to videotape all the drills and so that you can actually see the kids actually doing them. But for now, as most of you have seen, I had a little hurdle in my in my room here. Um, we may not be able to use that this time, but I wanted to tell you too, for everybody in this session, I'm going to give you, and it's free of charge. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm going to give you my contact number, my email and my cell phone number. This is what I do for my hurdlers, okay? Um, and so write this down, keep it with you. If you have any questions, you can email me. If you need me to even like give me a snippet of a video, I can analyze it for you and tell you exactly what's going on and then send it and send the notes back to you. I, I continually get videos from, from a lot of our athletes uh, that were at the Simplot games or the ones that came to our the Simplot uh, camp. But I will clarify any of the drills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Don't stalk me because then I'll block you. I'm kidding. I'm just joking with you. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to leave it up for another 15 seconds see if you, so you can write that down. Okay. If you send videos, don't send me videos that I have that are like way across the track. All right. Because it's kind of hard to analyze those, really. Um, generally, uh, people send me. Uh, videos to analyze uh, a particular workout so that I can see things up close, or what have you, or if they're coming out of the blocks or something of that nature, all right? All right, let's move on. So we went through a lot of the hurdle drills. So everybody that was in the first um, session, you know, we're not going to go through them again, but these are just some of the hurdle drills that we do. And there are, I mean, there are probably hundreds of hurdle drills that people have uh, made up or used one time or another. Um, so most of the drills are for beginner hurdlers, but I will tell you that I, I, when I was hurdling, I used them at the beginning of each season just to reinforce what I already knew. Um, and then I graduated to a lot of the advanced drills. Um, I'm not going to go through these because I, we only have like 40 minutes, but if you email me or text me or whatever, we can talk about the, the advanced drills. And generally, most high school athletes, very few of them get to the advanced drills. Um, but I will, in an email, tell you exactly what they are if you don't know already. So one of the things I really want to talk about is training. Um, you know what? Let me, let me back up a second. When you guys are teaching hurdles, um, you have to teach one thing at a time. So... Uh, a, a sort of a progressive way of teaching kids how to hurdle because it's not a natural thing to do. So what I would say to do is um, always, and I told folks in the first session, if you're going to hurdle in terms of running, always go over the entire hurdle. Never run the, on the side of the hurdle. If static drills, you can do on the side. If you're going to run, run over the entire hurdle, but just focus on one thing. The first thing you should always focus on are the arms. All right, those are your levers. Think of an airplane when you're flying and, you know, playing turns. And although the, the wings don't actually move, those are the levers, right? So when you're teaching hurdles and they're always teach the lead arm first. For many of our athletes, when I ask them about the lead arm, they will tell me that one, um, it's, it's, there are different methods. Um, I've heard people say that their coaches say, look at your watch, which is this right here. Um, what, what's the other thing? Uh, touch the lead leg toe, which, is, which crosses your body. Here's what I will tell you. Never let that lead arm cross the body. The, the, the lead arm really is a short punch. It's sort of right here, halfway. Don't, you never cross your body. But as you know, if you ask an athlete to give you that short punch, what are they going to do? It's going to come here, right? And when you come here, then you end up here. Let me see if I can stand up. You end up if I'm if I'm if if I'm here, 
and then my trail arm is here. When I bring my lead arm back, look what happens to my upper body because I'm bringing it back from a, sh a longer distance than I need to, and I have to hurry up and pull it. So it's going to make me twist, right? Lead arm should be, as you're teaching it, over-exaggerated. It should be a punch. And use the word punch. Punch. And make sure it goes straight out so that you can see it and the athlete can see it as they're going over the hurdle. So it's here, right? Eventually, once they get that, then you can shorten it up and do that short punch. But you notice it still is not going to, should not cross the midline of your body. So it's here, here, short punch, here. But as you're teaching them, it's a long punch, all right? And after you get that, and it's really just having them jog over the hurdle and you just watch them. I just watch hurdles for a while and I start correcting them and say, hey, no, make sure you get it straight out in front of you, right? Then you work the trail arm. Trail arm should go to the hip pocket, right here. Right here, big hip pocket, right? Whereas people say all the time, cheek to cheek, right? Not out here, not anywhere else if you're running on the straightaway. It's here. It's not dropping here, right? It's not down. It's 90 degrees. It's back here. So you're here, here, here. Then the next thing that you want to teach after you teach the lead arm and trail arm, depending on whether they're right leg league or left leg lead, is now you want to teach the, the lead leg in terms of bringing, up, bringing the knee up, not the foot. If you tell them the lead with the foot, they tend to swing. One, either tend to swing that foot up so then that leg is a straight leg and you don't want a straight leg. It should always be slightly bent coming over the hurdle. Or many of you have seen where they swing it outwards, right? They try to swing it around. And when we talked about the drills, we talked about always coming straight through. So, right? So you want to teach that part of the lead leg. There's another part of the lead leg. The second part of the, that you, and then the final, no, then the next part you want to treat is the trail leg. The trail leg should come all the way up to the, as high as you can get it, right? So trail leg comes as high as you can get it up toward the, your elbow. Bring it to the middle and then put it down, right? You don't want to drop that trail leg short. We call it dropping short when the athlete hurry up. You know, they come over the hurdle and then they take that trail leg and they put it out. They drop it out. And the way you can tell if they drop this short is if both of their feet are close together, they drop this short, right? Or they did not run off the lead leg. So if you see both of those feet really close together, they either, and you can tell when they drop it short, because, okay, here's what I'm going to tell you. When you're looking for the lead arm and the trail arm, you want to stand in front of the hurdle, right? So you want to watch them from the front so you can see the arm here, right? If you want to know whether or not they dropped it short, you stay in the front. If you want to see if they're running off the lead leg, then you want to stand at the side and watch them and see if they bring that lead leg down and push away from the hurdle, right? So you want, so I stand in different areas and different, right? Um, here's the, the hardest thing to teach them is to run off of that lead leg. That is the hardest thing. That is something that they really have to feel. I always call it pawing down. So they have, think of a cat, claws, that lead leg hits the ground, you paw down and you grab that track with your spikes and you push away from the hurdle. You grab the track and push away. Never ask an athlete to pull their trail leg through. They never whip the trail leg through. They don't pull the trail leg through. What brings that trail leg through is when they run off of that lead leg. So as soon as they push away from the hurdle, all you do is guide that trail leg to the middle and then it comes down. If you ask them to whip it through, there's gonna be some twisting. So either the arms are going to make you twist or, right, the, the legs, right? And here, let me show you one more thing with the arms before we move on. So when I talk about twisting, I mean, and you, and then as coaches or athletes, do this drill. Just have the, your athlete stand there and come across their body with um, 
their lead arm. So here, as fast as they can. Here. And I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing it here, right? It's taking me so much time to take it from here to back here. So I'm going to do it again. But a lot of times I try to do it with the legs, right? Cross, cross, cross. Now, do it with the short punch. It's, and you'll see that it's faster. You're here, as, as opposed to here, here, right? So you're wasting a lot of energy, wasting a lot of time, and it's incorrect. Everybody got that? All right, so we'll move on from there, but you have my contact, so. Um, trying to give you a few more tips. So remember, lead arm, trail arm, driving into the hurdle, trail leg, and then the hardest piece, teaching the athlete how to run off the hurdle. So always look for those five things first, okay? Um, interval training. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little about that because this is <laughs> so important and you already know about it. I'm just going to slightly go over this. So when you are training an athlete, um, coaches come out with particular workout every day, right? They write up their workouts, they come out. A lot of coaches don't ch change the workout, right? Sometimes you have to adapt, and you heard John Register say, in what his was obviously deeper. But in terms of, of, of training athletes, you come out, there are times when you have to adapt based on a lot of different things. One, the weather. The weather will make you change a workout, right? The other thing that will make you change a workout is you're watching your athletes, and they're either warming up like a thousand-year-old woman or a thousand-year-old man, you know, like really slow, really sluggish. Sometimes you change your workout and provide them with a workout that they feel confident. One, that they can do, but two, it, they, they love the workout. Um, for me, if I'm coming out jogging like a thousand year old man, don't let me run repeat 500 because I will still run like a thousand year old man. Have me run 150s. Oh, but I can still run the same volume. So if I had to run three 500s, um, which is 1,500 meters, right? I can I can do that with running what? What is it? 10 150s? Is that is that about 1,500 meters? I don't know. My math. Sorry. Right? But I love running 15 uh, 150s. Right? So I'm going to be more successful because I get to do what I really like to do versus running repeat 500. So whatever volume you have that day, if you have to change it, change it. They don't know. Athletes, we don't know. Ben's not going to know. Is Ben in here? Yeah. Ben's not going to know. He's not going to know, coach. Well, now he might know because he's listening. Um, <laughs> so you want to, so for instance, and the other thing, my coach used to always come out with a world-class workout, which he calls, that's a gold medal workout. He comes out with a weather workout and he comes out with the, the thousand year old man workout. And it, depending on what I look like, he changes it. But here's what he does not change. He may, he may change um, the distance. Like he may change, you know, right there, you see the sample. 10, 200 meters, I have to run them in 25 seconds and I get two minutes and 30 seconds of interval, right? So I would run at 200 meters in 25 seconds, two, two and a half minutes, I got to run another one, right? Um, so he doesn't change the repetition, all right? He doesn't change the speed. What he in what he changes for me, um, he either changes the distance or the sectors or how far we're going to run, and he may change um, the interval. But the only time he changes the interval, it's not to give me more rest; it's to give me less rest. So as coaches, never change the interval, even if they don't make the twenty-five seconds. It's okay. You're trying to build that base, right? Because kids will come and tell you, I can't do it, coach. I'm, I'm tired. I can't do it. I just can't do it. Right? No. My coach would always come up, check my pulse, and go, uh, you can do it. Your heart doesn't lie. Right? And so he doesn't change the recovery period. Now, the only time he changes the recovery period is if 
he sees that I'm really handling these workouts really well. So say for instance, I'm running 200 meters, man, I get to about the fifth one or the sixth one and I'm, I'm kicking butt. I'm not even tired, right? And he's like, I'm dancing and I'm doing, right? Then he thinks about it. And he goes, okay, all right, he's feeling good today. So instead of, instead of giving me two minutes and 30 seconds, he may only give me two minutes. And I don't know that. I walk back and then all of a sudden I hear, all right, let's go. I'm going, was that two minutes? I didn't know I didn't get all my rests, right? But I have to go. And I didn't realize this for years later that, yeah, he changed it based on what I look like, right? So never change um, the reps, never change the time. Because sometimes I've run workouts where I didn't even make the time. I like, look, I didn't even make the time. But he still kept me on that interval because he's trying to build build me. He's trying to get me to run without oxygen, right? That lactic acid, trying to get me to run when I'm tired, right? What the... I would say the mistake that most coaches do is they give him more time. Oh, he looks tired. I'm going to give him five minutes. No, never change that interval, okay? Now, there are different things that they do in between. Like there's activities performed uh, during the recovery period. Most of the time I walk, all right? I walk, I get some water, I walk across the track, I get ready for the next one. There are times when you have them jog in between. So that's part of the recovery period. All right, but you still give them two minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and so this is just something here. I'm just going to leave it here. It's just to divide. You got to divide your season up into three different programs, right? So I don't know when you guys start training. It could be December. It could be January. I don't know. But you always divide it up. If your kid does not have a base, if they don't have a base, it's going to be very difficult to get them to run high quality races all the way through the season. What tends to happen is people tend to go to the middle and the racing part of the season right away. And you, you guys have seen this where the kids are running really fast in the beginning of the season. Like you're going, damn, this kid is running. And then you don't see him in the state meet. You don't see him in those big meets toward the end because they have burnt out, all right? So you want to get an early season in, which I hate because I hate running distance. I hate going two mile runs and five mile runs and all of that. Um, I hate running, um, you know, repeat 1200 meters in practice. Who wants to do that? I'm a sprinter, right? Um, but it's necessary to build that base. And then you move into the middle season, right? Which is the, you know, shorter interval stuff. And the racing season comes at the end of the season. Let me give you an example. So think of a tornado. Anybody ever seen a tornado before? Anybody? Thumbs up? Nobody? I haven't either, but I've seen them on Weather Channel. All right. Um, think of a tornado. If I lived in Iowa uh, and, I, and I'm a third generation or fourth generation Iowan, and I see a tornado miles in the distance across the field or way, wherever, you know, you know, 20 miles away and I see this tornado, I guarantee you I'm going to know whether or not that tornado is going to reach my house or not based on the base of that tornado at the top of the sky. How wide is that base, right? Because we know the fastest part of that tornado is not at the top, right? It's at the bottom, right? So the top of it is that early season. It's like, I'm going to run you slow and short recovery, right? So let me give you an example. Um, say in October or whatever, or let's say November when I start training for the Olympics and the Olympics were in September of the next year. He might start me off running and I'll just use 500 meters as a, um, an example. He might have me running eight 500 meters in practice, right? I might come through the 400 meters at about 60 seconds, right? But I only get three minutes in between, three and a half minutes of rest, which is not a lot of rest when you're running 500 meters, right? That's the early season. As I start moving along from November to December, you know, he may give me, you know, I, I go down to six of them, six 500 meter runs, but I'm coming through the 400 meters at 
you know, 55 meters now, 55 seconds, right? So I'm speeding up, but now he gives me a little extra recovery time. So now I'm getting like, instead of three and a half minutes, he's giving me four and a half minutes rest, right? Or five minutes rest in between. As I get to the middle season, which means I need to run a little faster with longer recovery because now I build that base. I got that F5 tornado going, right? My base is like 800 meters or, or a mile wide, right? And I'm coming down into that middle season. Now he may have me run four 500s, but now I'm coming through at 51 seconds in the 400 meters and finishing off, right? 51 seconds, but now I get six minutes. I'm so happy I get six and a half minutes rest. That four, that's it, right? When I get to the racing, se racing season, which in my Olympic year, I was still in my middle season. I didn't get to my racing in terms of race. When I call it racing, I mean speed on the track season. When I get to my racing season or just a month away from the Olympics, I might only be running two 500s, right? That's if I run 500s that day. I'm just using 500s as one sample workout. If I run two 500s, now I have to come through the 400 meters at 46 seconds flat, right? But guess what? I get 25 minutes rest in between. I get full recovery in between, but I have to run two. What the mistakes some of the coaches have or what they're doing is they're going either straight to the middle season or they're going straight to the racing season. They're going straight to like, I'm only going to let them run three 500s today, but they get 10, 15 minutes recovery. It doesn't build base at all, right? You have, you're more susceptible to getting injured, right? So start off the season going slow and long with your recovery. Um, and the sample with the 200 meters, you get real quick and I'll move on. So if I go 200 meters, I might run 10 of them in October. Um, I might run two of them in the racing season. I might start off running 30 seconds in November, but in July, I have to run two of them, but I have to run them under 20 seconds flat with a running start, right? The racing season. Think of that tornado. Next time when you're, as you're, you're planning these workouts, think of that tornado. If my base, if an IO wind sees a base about this wide, like this wide, they're going to go back in and have dinner. Because they're going to go, it ain't even going to reach us, you guys. Keep eating, right? But if they see that base a mile wide or half mile, they're like, get in the cellar, people. It's time to go, right? That's what you want other athletes. That's how you want your athlete to feel. Like, I can get in a race, and I can move when I want to move, and I can handle three, four races uh, every Saturday, you know, whenever they run their events, right? They know. They can feel that. You know, as opposed to going, whoo, I might be fast in February and March, but I'm going to be very, very, I'm going to be burnt out by the time I get to the state meet season, right? And, and if you guys email me, we can talk a little bit more about this and you can give me, talk about sample workouts. So this is, oh, and then here's some tips for you guys, coaches and, and athletes, because I never wanted this as well. Never tell an athlete what their workout is. Don't pin those workouts on a board right? In the gym or wherever. Because if you tell me I have to run 500 meters on Monday, I have a dentist appointment, okay? All right? I don't want to know, right? Wait till they complete their warm-up. That way, if you have to change the workout, um, you can change that workout, right? Based on what they're, and, and then they still feel successful. They still feel like, okay, I can handle this workout versus you give them that workout that you have planned and they really suck at it, which we all will um, at some point. And right. And then never tell them how many repetitions. Don't tell them even during the workout. Just say, hey, we're running 200s today. You don't have to tell them how many. I always knew how many on the last one when my coach says last one. Then you go, all right, <laughs> right, last one. Right. Other than that, I don't want to know. When I was training by myself and he was away. He would send them to me in envelopes. I would, I, this is how good I was. I was so, I was, I was so 
I didn't want to know. So I would warm up, stretch, do my drills, get ready. And then I go and open my envelope like I was winning a prize. And then, yes, then I would know what my workout is, right? Um, document everything, coaches. Um, I wish I had my book. I have my coach wrote down everything. I have like little uh, journals that he gave to me after the Olympics, after I finished of all the workouts, everything. He put the weather in there. He put what my mood was, what surface was like. And, and this is what I was telling you before. Don't be afraid to adapt the workout. Do not be afraid. Keep the same volume, but change the distance or the sector. Um, incorporate hurdles in there twice a week. So those 500s I was telling you about, what I would do sometimes is I would run a 400 or almost a 400 or 300 and I have to run the last 200 meters over hurdles, right? Or I would run the first three hurdles and I and then run the 500. Throw some hurdles in there. And here's the deal. If, you're, if there are 300 hurdler or 400 hurdler, put the hurdles anywhere. It doesn't matter. Because you want, because how many times do you have to adapt or go over with your opposite leg, right? So it taught me how to adapt if, as you heard John say about that Kansas wind that hit him, like, you know, then that, I, that wind is in my face, I'm going to have to adapt. This teaches them to adapt as well. And then so many coaches don't run in the rain, rain even with the all weather track, the rain is only going to get you wet. I'll give you an example. I, I was home when Olympic year. I was home. It was pouring out. I'm thinking, there's no way I'm working out today, right? I'm sitting there just chilling. My coach calls me and goes, where the hell are you? I said, coach, it's raining like cats and dogs out there. He's like, get your out here. We're working out. So I knew then that rain or shine, we were working out. It's an all-weather track. And then the day of the meet coaches and athletes, listen to this. Cut the umbilical cord. Coach, get your hot dog, get your nachos, go sit in the stands, right? Tell them what they're going to run. Go up there, pull your, your stopwatch out, call it a day, all right? You, you, they have to learn how to run on their own because I think it happens in the state meet, you, you know, for, especially for sprints. I mean, just let, let them go. Let them learn, all right? Um, because my coach always says conditioning breeds confidence. Conditioning. So if I got that base up there, guess what? I feel strong. I feel fast. I'm confident that when I get in this race, that I'm going to vie for that, for that first place, right? And then conserve your reserves as, the, as an athlete. This is for athletes. When you're warming up, don't do anything extra. Don't do anything, you know, crazy or whatever. Conserve your reserves. Save it for the race, right? Focus, all right? Um, and then when they're warming up, hey, if it's 70 degrees or less, keep your sweats on when you're warming up. I, don't, I God, but Bob's moon, I see athletes out there when it's even 60 degrees, if you're a sprinter and you're warming up with just shorts on. I'm like, man, if you don't put on those sweats, I mean, just put them on. Um, and then if you're going to do the old fashioned warm up, jog at least a mile. Every workout, I would jog a mile and then do my stretching. Or if you do the kinesthetic warm up, you know, some of them do, you know, they, they jog and do stretches and do all that. You can do that, the ballistic warm up, go for it. Be, you have to be sort of a combination of a flounder and a shark. Either just lay there and do static stretching, which I suggest all hurdlers do because of the, the, the motion of hurdling is not natural. So you must stretch those hip flexors and those glutes and get it all ready and, and then keep it moving like a shark. Okay, um, here's variety is the spice of life. This is just a sample. So if you look Monday through oh, Friday, look at Monday, week one, Monday, Tuesday. I, and if you look at Monday all the way down, I'm not running 500 meters every Monday. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to eat the same. Even though I love, I love lasagna, I don't want it every Monday. I don't want it every Monday. I would get tired of it. I want variety, right? So I would come out every Monday. I wouldn't even know what I'm doing. And I'll have to tell you about the 50s. It's not just running a 50 and then jog. It's, it's, it's called 50s workouts, right? So you would run a 50, jog a 50, run a 50, jog a 50. And I would do that for a mile in November. 
The last hundred, I would run all the way through. That is the most painful workout I've ever experienced in my life. When you text me or, or email me or whatever, I'll explain that one to you. Um, this is just a sample. These are actual samples of my 1988 workouts from, from my coach, right? So these are just samples. Like oh, over in uh, week six, you can see I ran 600 meters. And I think, I forgot what, this was in December, I think. I, once, I ran three 600 meters. The next day I ran 10 150s. The next day I ran two 800s. And then look, it says Thursday I was hurt. I was faking. I wasn't faking. Um, I, I either twitched and then, but look, but then I came back the next day and I had to run eight 200s, right? And then the next week, look, 300s on Monday, 300s. But this one, he made me run 300s. Oh, I'm, he, look, he messed up. Uh -huh. um, he messed up on these two because he had me running. Oh, I think he messed up and put the same weeks there. Um, but these are typical workouts. And you notice he'll he'll put stuff on here like, my back was tight or my hip and week three, my hip was tight, you know, um, Saturday, a long bike ride. Um, he, he, and so let me tell you guys this. Are you guys all high school coaches? So let me tell you this. The coach that coached me for the 1988 Olympics was my high school coach. I did these workouts in high school as well. So everything I'm telling you, because we as Olympians or world record holders or uh, world-class athletes, we didn't wake up as a kid and go, we're world-class athletes, right? We didn't. It, it, it grew on us or we had to figure it out or we had coaches that recognized the talent or what have you. And so my high school coach, I went home to my high school coach to, to, for the Olympics. Um, and he was the same coach that coached the great Lee Evans in high school as well, you know? Um, and so he, he was an awesome coach. Um, uh, let's see here. So I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with workout design, whatever you guys want, whatever you need for my hurdlers, you know what I mean? Or sprinters or 400 meters. Um, and then motivation, all right? One, it's a shared responsibility. It's not just your job as a coach or your job as an athlete to motivate yourself, right? It's a shared responsibility. You know, um, if you watch even like even the NBA coaches, I'm going to tell you right now, um, the NBA coaches, those are, those are great athletes, right? A lot of what those coaches do is motivate them in those timeouts, right? Keep their spirits high. And it's about having a direction, which means have some goals. You always got to have the goals, whether it's a short-term goal, intermediate goal, long-term goal. For your, for your, for you as a coach for your athletes and athletes, write them down. I used to write them down, and when I was in high school, and I put them in my, my binder. I put it in the mirror in my bathroom or on my wall, and I always was able to look at that goal every day. And if I change the goal, then I change those cards, right? Um, and it's about selling to the to the athlete. Don't tell an athlete to do something. It's not nearly as effective when you do that. And they want to know why. And especially when you're explaining, it can't be because I said so, right? My, my high school coach would say, if you ask me a question about a workout about why we're doing it and I can't explain it to you, then we're not doing it, right? But on the flip side of that, he may ask me what we did last week. What did we do last Monday? And I better know it, right? It's an everyday job, not just before competitions, right? You're motivating those, those kids, right? And avoid comparisons between your athletes, right? You might have four hurdlers. They all have different speed indexes, power indexes. Strength. They all have their own things that they need to work on. And make sure that, you know, you don't avoid, you know, avoid comparisons. Because I hear coaches sometimes going, come on, man, be like Jim over there or be like Maria over there. No, be like yourself, right? Be in your lane, your head, focus on what you need to do, right? Uh, motivate by challenges rather than threats. If you don't do this, and be positive, uh, encourage teamwork, um, handle failures and mistakes constructively. Like, here's the deal. I, as a coach, yelling at an athlete doesn't work. Think of it as a teacher. If I yelled at the kids in the classroom, it doesn't work. 
I had, I had, I did have coaches that did yell, but most of the time I had coaches that would teach, that would explain, hey, this is what we need to do, you guys. This is, no, that looked ugly. Here's what you need to do with that trail leg, or here's what you need to do with that lead arm. That works so much better. They feel so much more confident doing that. Um, and you have to model that motivation so they can model it for other folks and their own teammates. And these are my favorite two, is have fun. Now, Kevin and Christy know that I joke around all the time. I have fun all the time. I even had fun when I was running. I, would, I, I mean, I, it, I wasn't like Usain Bolt on the line. You see how he had fun, like he just before the race? That's his way of loosening up, right? Have fun. And then the other thing, if your athlete is sick or injured, rest them. That was one of my mistakes. I thought even when I was injured, I better get out there because I, don't, I know Edwin Moses is out there running. I know he's running today. So I have to be out there. But I end up hurting myself even more. Um, so just make sure that if your athlete is, you know, or they need more recovery in terms of after a, a long Saturday of, of, you know, busting their butt for four races, man, maybe Monday is a light workout. You know what I mean? You don't want to burn them out. Um, let's see. And then I put here that motivation is a critical ingredient for success, both in and out of sports. One element will allow you to get back up on that horse. I'm, I, and I'm not kidding either. One, oh, uh, let me go back for you. One element will allow you to get back on that horse, being positive just to that kid that one time, right? You know? Think of something motivational to say, even when they come in last place, you know? And so with that, I'm going to thank you guys. I know this, I have so much more to tell you, you know, we could have talked about, you know, you, just never mind. We could have talked about a whole bunch of things, but you have my contact. Really reach out to me, you guys. Seriously, I call me even, you know, let me know you're going to call me. And if I'm available, boom, I will call you. We can even talk, you know? You can put me on FaceTime if you're out there on your track and you want me to see something real time, right? And I've had that happen too, as long as I'm not in one of my other meetings, okay? Right? So thank you guys very much. I know that was a lot of stuff and it was fast. And I apologize again for my Zoom mishaps in the first session, but you have my Andre, contact. So you Andre, can, this has been fantastic. Right? Uh, just hearing the stories about what you really went through and, and these tips for the coaches and the athletes. Love it. Uh, I think some of it's going to be new to a lot of us, but thank you for that. I think folks, we only have a few seconds. Again, remember we're automatically moved into the main, into the main room, if you will. And it looks like just uh, one minute and then uh, um, we'll be back with Andre and John register uh, both Andre and John will answer questions and, or maybe Andre even talk about these same kind of things you're talking about and, and how do we do things outside of sports, just like we yeah. do with inside sports. You're, you're an educator, my friend. And I love the fact that you're educating young people um, outside of sports and inside sports. So thank you for what you do and everyone um, we'll talk to Andre in, a, in about another, uh, another few minutes, but uh, 25 seconds and we're all back in the main room. I'm going to be quiet. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Christy. Thank all of you for attending. Um, I hope you use the contact. Really, I mean it. Call me, text me, call me, send me videos. I, I better be careful about saying that, huh, Christy? I was going to say, make, he's honest and he's truthful on that. So for you kids yeah. that are on here, he's Seriously. not joking. So send no. him your stuff. 